Hi guys, it's James and welcome to episode one of the Optics Warehouse podcast. Today I am joined by John Farbrother. Obviously you would have seen him on some of our videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, and we are here today to talk specifically about the air gun world, um, and more specifically further than that, is obviously John's discipline, which is field target. Um, so obviously, let's say John is here. Nice to have you here today, mate. Thank you very much for having me. That's all right. It's not a problem at all. Obviously, as the um, majority of you know from seeing on, on YouTube, he is the former 2018 BFTA and WFTC Springer champion. That's world champion, I may add. So um, we like to think he is fairly well versed um, in the topic, so to speak. But um, well, I have my moments here and there. <laughs> but, uh, I suppose this will see how good I actually am, won't Exactly, it? exactly. I've only got a few, few questions for you today, obviously. And the point is to just to see... Um, uh, what people what people would need to do just to get into field target into HFT as well we'll come on to that into a second um, and what you have found works works best for you over the past few years um, so really this is the first sort of question I'm going to ask you is um, well how did you get into it so originally it was um, parents so parents both from shop um, was a club called West London Rangers dad was one of the founding members there uh, and obviously through the years of living up there built that club up with uh or dad built the club up with the original members as well. Yeah, That's still a club that's going strong at the moment. Uh, I don't think many of the original members are there, because obviously they're getting on a bit. <laughs> but other than that, um, I know that club's going from strength to strength, but that's what got me into it. Um, also, a chap that's also very well known in field target is Nick Jenkinson. Yeah, uh, Met him at a very young age. Mm -hmm. uh, introduced me to a few more rifles and how to shoot field target correctly yeah. as well. Uh, so... He, he was a big influence on me getting into the discipline. Uh, as I say, just family and, friend, and sort of family friends getting into it and going through from there. Fair enough. I mean, obviously, um, let's say it is spring guns you obviously you shoot with and, and air arms. They are generally tend to be your weapon of choice, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've shot all sorts over the years and now uh, I've sort of fluttered between PCP and spring gun. Yeah. But I do get a lot more enjoyment out of shooting the spring gun. Yeah. Uh, it's more rewarding. Yeah. So... Yes, PCP is very, very clinical, and um, you don't get much feeling back through when you're shooting. As I say, the spring gun just gives that bit more, bit more a challenge to it. Okay, no, that's that's, that's fair enough. Because so, so, I imagine there's a, as I see with the with the plethora of PCPs that you see out there on the market at the moment, you don't tend to see a huge amount of obviously what you will do in your circuits, but generally you don't tend to see a huge amount of spring spring uh, air gun shooters doing FT. So it's obviously it's um it's interesting to see see how you um. How you put it across and, and what you think and what you think's best between the two. Um, just really sort of see. So you got into that. That's fair enough. Obviously, based out in London, then obviously you came down down here to Paynton and whatnot. Um, I mean, how did you really start off going further and further? Is it just like through smaller competitions, building up, or was it? Yeah, I mean, so that my competition shooting started when I was sixteen, and um, that was well, be sorry, fourteen, mm -hmm. and that was at a club called Buckleywood at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, going through there was sort of club competitions. I did two to three club competitions. I then went into what's called SWEFTA, which yeah. is Southwest of England Field Target Association. Mm -hmm. uh, so that basically covers us between Bristol and Land's End. So quite a huge yeah. area of um, sort of the, the yeah. clubs actually cover. And it is the biggest area of um, UK that is covered by a single discipline or yeah. by a single governing body with it. Um Obviously, travelling further afield of that was, at the time, way too expensive and a lot of effort to go and do. Mm -hmm. And obviously, not driving myself at that point yeah, yeah, yeah. meant I could only really do the local comps. I did that until I was around about 17, mm -hmm. 17, 18. And if I'm honest, got a little bit bored with just the same club, same... Yeah. Uh, every year, it, it just seems very, very similar. And mm -hmm. um, Once again, my interest got lost. Went and did a few other sports and disciplines. And then got back into field target after uh, my father passed away. Mm -hmm. Just sort of reignited the interest in it. Yeah. Um, obviously, by that time, I could then afford to travel. I had my own vehicle going around doing the competitions, which led me into the um, Grand Prix. Yeah. Uh, obviously, coming in was well, sort of an unknown and not really knowing what to expect. I think my first few comps, I was down in sort of 11th, 12th ish. And um, coming up rapidly from there, it's sort of an eye opener of the more difficult courses and how everything changes when you go to different parts of the UK. Mm. And the courses aren't set up in a straight line. They're all through open tr open land, trees, over water. So many different contributing factors that you're not used to in one go. No. It just, it was a, a shock for the senses as such to start yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, 
Uh, the more you did it, the better you got at it. So it's once once again, you, you can practice as much as you like at your home club, but there's no replacement for actually getting out there and practicing in competition. Yeah. Uh, and to say, yeah, that's what took me from level to level with that. And um, once again, on to the sort of world world series and go through that way. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fair enough. So you, I presume, obviously, you were on the on the world series circuit for a few years, obviously, before the, the big one in 2018. Or so my first one was 20, oh, 2015 or 2016, but it was in uh, Portugal. Mm-hmm. So I went to went to there, did the um, world championship there. Ended up having to fix a load of guns on the firing line during my practice day because <laughs> uh, the spring guns are. Well, they're renowned for not doing very well in different temperatures because yeah. of the grease involved and, and how they work. So my t- I got half an hour's practice to an hour's practice on the first day. Yeah. And the rest of my time was spent helping repair other guns. Yeah, but yeah. obviously with that, you get a bit of a rotation around people and it, it boosts yourself. It's nice yeah. helping people. and That's part of the spring gun side of it. PCP can be very, from what I found, it's very almost stab in the back type thing of, well, I'm okay. But I'll, right. I'll carry on. Whereas <laughs> yes. the spring gun groups, everybody, no matter what, what country you're from, and they all just seem to sort of club together with it a bit more, and there's a yeah. bit more sort of okay. can uh, can uh, come ship as such. Yeah, so. yeah, okay. No, that, that, that makes obviously that makes sense. As I say, um, I say you've been um, you've been with optics obviously a few years now, and I, I can only imagine that. Well, well sorry, I can only imagine this is this is me just guessing now. Have you have you stuck with one specific scope, or like do you? That is a certain range of scopes. Anything that you'd found particularly well for your setup. So I mean, when I when I started off properly in interfield target, mm. uh, doing the national competitions, I started with a big uh, sorry Falcon T fifty. Mm-hmm. Uh, that lasted me about three weeks until I decided I, I had enough for that. It worked, yeah. worked good enough for what I needed. Yeah, uh, very good as a starting scope, but yeah. obviously the faster you progress, yeah, it, yeah. it's very quickly out of its depth. Yeah. I then went across to a big Nico, so mm. the Nico Mark III 10, 50, 60. Yeah. Uh, really is still one of the better scopes you can go for. Mm. Obviously, I've been discontinued, still ready available. Yeah. But it is the benchmark in which most scopes are judged by. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, then went from that to the Cytron S3. Yeah. Uh, didn't bother with the field target model, it was just a standard long range. So yeah. parallax came down to 13 yards. Yeah. But it was easy enough with a close focus adapter, you could then see the closer targets. Yeah, yeah. No problem at all. From that, I went to a uh, Vortex Golden Eagle. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that did me very well for a while. That's what I used to get. Um, so if we go back to this, the Golden Eagle is what I had on in um, Poland. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Portugal. And with that, so I, I got 11th place in my first ever f- uh, world field target yeah, competition. Yeah. Um, and had, I think it was the joint or second joint top score on the second day using that scope. So it's obviously a very capable scope. Yeah, with yeah, that. 100%. Yeah. Um, I had that for the following year as well, which was done in Wales. Mm-hmm. Um, from that, I went from the 11th to a joint first place. Right. Um, with that, for it's Golden Eagle. Mm. Uh, so it's, once again, very, very capable scope. Mm. Um, once again, that wouldn't come down to 10 yards. That came down to 15. But mm. that close focus adapter allowed, yeah, allowed yeah, for yeah. that. After the Golden Eagle, I moved straight away. I had one of the first Delta Strikers that came into the country. Yep. Um, so we were sent two over. One went to Richard Dutting. Yeah. One came to myself. Yeah. Um, obviously, for the two complete different disciplines, that's yeah, going to cover. Yeah, it's for long range yeah. sense yeah. fire of what I do, and that I haven't changed from that since. No. Um, I've got another two of them, which I've got on other rifles. Yeah. So I say the Delta for me personally is the best field target scope available, as long as you're constantly concentrating when you're using it. Okay. Because it's a very slow, or well, it's not very slow, but it, the Parallax on there mm. isn't snappy as such. Okay, if you're yeah. a field target uh, shooter, you'll understand what I mean by snappy. Yeah. It will, um, as you focus in, the whole image will sort of slowly come into focus. And then you're looking for very, very fine detail of the target yes. that actually tells you when it's in focus. Mm. Whereas the Nikos, Cytrons, and also the Falcon X50, mm. they all snap in very quickly. So the whole image goes from blurred to very, very clear yeah, very yeah. quickly. So as a beginner, and also if you're not practicing constantly, Mm. Much easier to learn them style of scopes. No, but for, for me, the Delta is probably the best okay. that I would, I would recommend. Okay. So you, you moved on really onto the Delta, obviously, one, because obviously it was one of the first ones in the country, and two, obviously, because of the whole parallax going down to less than 15 yards. So it's... Yeah, as I say, once I'd had it, it, it just wiped the floor of anything I'd yeah. used for me, for how it works for me. Yeah, that yeah. slow focus coming in, I didn't quite like, but the way it snaps on the very fine detail okay. and the glass quality you get that allows you to see that fine detail. Yeah. That's what did it for me. That's and fine. ever since then, my range finds has been absolutely bang on. Mm. No, no, fair enough. Obviously, say the, 
the, the, the striker was it's um obviously the five and a half five and a half to fifty that one. Uh, five to fifty. Five to fifty, sorry, yeah. So obviously the second the second focal plane one. So obviously that's a it's another big debate. Obviously you have to excuse my naivety. I mean, do you see many um FT shooters using a first focal plane scope? Not support? particularly. Um there's a couple of reasons for that. First focal plane, when you get higher mag. Mm. The reticle size increases yeah. massively. So obviously when you're shooting between eight yards or sorry, ten yards and fifty five, yeah. that huge reticle takes up a lot of that target. Yeah, I can yeah, um, compared to what it would be on a second vocal plane. Yeah. So if you're looking for pallet test and group test as such, yeah. your that your reticle's covering that tiny little aim point you want to yes. be in that to test. Yeah, yeah, so so it's, it's counterproductive. Mm. If you were and and we dial, mm. we don't hold over. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. So as a dialing scope mm. and you're dialing each target, you're not looking for the miss and then dialing up to it. Yeah. It's one shot per target. So the first focal plane doesn't really give you any benefit. Okay. No, so it's, so. it's just it's just interesting obviously because I think you'll see you just said earlier on the striker went to yourself and went to Richard Utting and those who don't know, Richard Utting's obviously um quite a prolific long range shoot here in the UK and we do we send quite a few bits and pieces to him. Um and you see quite a lot of long range centre fire users using first focal plane scopes. Um, and you would think it'd be the same principle. So it's just interesting to see if it would have correlated across to sort of like the, the field target sort of aspects. Some of it does. Uh, but what you'll find is mainly the scopes that are used for F-class type shooting yeah. are then happily being, being used for field targets right, okay, as yeah. such. Yeah. So it's that very fine reticle that mm. helps you at that distance. It's yeah. not taking over much of the target. Yes, yeah. So it allows for that finer, finer point of aim. Yeah, no, I can, I, well, I can understand what you mean. So, I certainly mean from a hunting point of view, like whenever I have a digital scope, I tend to put a second focal blade reticle on there just because, again, if you've got a target that's, say, 200 yards away, I know that's not a great distance, but if you have a first focal blade ret, it does make the, the point of aim that's slightly bigger. And obviously, if you want to just slightly hold over for the wind and whatnot, all that sort of stuff, it does make it slightly harder. So, so yeah, that makes... Um, well, that makes um, sense. I mean, uh, I'll come on. I'll come on now back to the World Championship. Obviously, 2018. That was a big year for you. Yeah, that was um, a big year. That was in Poland. Yeah, and that was yeah. Um, just yeah. Just obviously through the build up on that one. How did um, how did you get on get on through that one then? Uh, so, so I mean, it's the same as the other one. So you, obviously, you've got to qualify throughout the year. Well, normally you have to qualify throughout the year. Yeah. Uh, I'm lucky to the point of where I placed at the World Championships previously. Mm. That gained me. The level that I needed right. to then get an automatic entry. Okay. So for that, if you place in the podium, yeah. you get automatic entry to next year's uh, okay. uh, World Championships. Yeah. So obviously, my joint first lab needs yeah. to do that. Um, so obviously, when you're there, you sort of acclimatise yourself to conditions. Mm. I was thinking, I was a little bit surprised when I got there because I was thinking Poland is not going to be too warm mm. uh, time of the year. It was very hot and very humid. <laughs> uh, and we had all the weather. We had blinding sunshine. And then thunderstorms, which stopped the play at one of the shoots. We had to finish early <laughs> on one of the on one of the days. Yeah. Uh, well, sorry, that was the first day. We had to finish early. Yeah. Uh, didn't quite get through all of the course. No. So we had to pick up where we left off the following day, which yeah. is for me it was unheard of. I've ne- never had to do that before in a field target competition. Yeah. But it's obviously, world championships are renowned for mm. groundbreaking events, and what yeah. we, you can't change it when you're there. No, no. Um, so we ended up doing the second day was meant to be obviously world championship courses are fifty shot to fifty target courses. Yeah, I think I did sixty two targets <laughs> that day to try and get through. Yeah, um, so obviously that takes its toll on you concentrating for that long. Yeah, yeah. but I uh, pulled through, did what I thought was acceptable. Mm. I, I thought I was, I think I was up in the top six mm. as of the first day. Yeah, and then obviously the second day I just got my head down and ploughed on. As I say, got what I thought was a respectable acceptable score yeah um, and then to my surprise it was enough to clinch it the um, yeah. reason why for the third day unfortunately had been called off due to weather mm. um, once again I, we had a meeting all together um, sort of the, the people that were up um, for picked their country mm. to talk about what they would want the event to be yeah um, I know it was, a, it was almost like a 50-50 split going down mm. for wanting the event to continue yeah um, I was one of them I wanted the event to continue yeah. for three days but unfortunately, due to the weather, yeah. um, they did say that they were going to call it a day because it was unsafe in the okay. environment it was. It's yeah. almost, if you can imagine an old quarry, yeah. you've got very big rock faces that are quite susceptible to yes. a lot of moisture, a lot of rainwater coming down. Yeah. There could have been slippages and yeah. issues that way, and we were shooting very, very close to them. Yeah. So it's, it's disappointing of how it was done, but yeah. unfortunately, nothing can be changed. Oh, that's fine. So basically saying you won by default. Right? So, so, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah pretty yeah, much. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> being here and being interviewed by you, that, that now is the cream of um, oh, my, yeah, my yeah, shooting, well, yeah. shooting career. <laughs> I understand that. Um, I've only got a couple more couple more questions. I, don't, I won't take too much of your time. Um, just um, 
So why why do you prefer FT to HFT? I just don't like rolling around in the mud. Field <laughs> <laughs> field target is you sat down, you put your range is hard to say ten yards, fifty five, yeah. two tucks per lane, power up in, shoot from there. Yeah. Uh, plus the fact I'm pretty damn useless at HFT. Right. Okay. I, I, I can shoot swifter rules, which yeah. means I can change parallax very slightly. Yes. But um, when you when you're doing uh, UK HFT, yeah, you can't change any sets on the scope. So what you Good start with, you yeah. set with 25 yards, for example. Yeah. Uh, you have got targets from 45 to eight yards. Yeah. Um, I struggle with parallax error. I know how to get around it, but I don't do it enough to yeah, yeah. really become good at it. And I, I say I've always shot field target more so. Yeah. Dad's always shot it and it just brought me up into it. Mm. I enjoyed the odd foray into HFT, but mm. no. for me, just I, I'm more comfortable with with field target. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I mean, I mean, that's the last last thing I really go over. I mean, obviously, as evidenced by you, um, anyone could be a world champion. So, um, if um, <laughs> if um, anyone's looking to get into FT, what would you uh, what would you sort of recommend? I mean, I'm not saying everyone is going to become a world champion, but as I say, from you, it's I mean, possible. Yeah, I mean, I say it is possible. Any, anyone can do it if if you want to put the effort in and yeah. you want to put, like prioritize your practice and shooting. Yeah, yeah, you you bang on. Anyone mm. could do it. Mm. How much do you want it? That, that's the main yeah, question yeah. on on actually right, doing, so, so, doing anything in any discipline. Yeah. How much do you want it? Exactly. So you can sit there and sit, yeah. sit at your level that you're happy with. Yeah. Or you can push yourself and push yourself and push yourself. Yeah. And that's what separates me from you. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> still with that, as I say, you don't need to go out and get the most expensive kit. Yeah. I mean, my CX200 that I used for uh, for my World Championships, yeah. I picked up second hand for £150. Yeah. It was absolutely red rusty. <laughs> um, obviously, it's not done look like that now. It's chrome plated yeah, that yeah. does nothing to it apart yeah. from makes it look a yeah, bit tartish yeah. but I like it and that's all that matters yeah um, I say starting off with it all I won the European Championships uh, or the uh, BFTA European Championships yeah with a standard stock um, with a bit of lead that I melted into the back of the butt to make the gun weigh a bit more and a protector leather bag on the front that yeah. I filled with old pellets and strapped yeah. that to the gun yeah. to give me a little bit of height on the yeah. fore end the scope I had on the time was say that was the sight yeah so the gun, gun wise, once you get used to it, mm. you pretty much do it with any rifle. As long as you're putting in mm. a 50, if your rifle is capable of a 50 mil group mm. or say 40 mil group mm. at 55 yards, mm. you're capable to, to be, be right up there. Yeah. Obviously, the tighter group you can get, the more yeah, charge yeah, you've yeah. got of hitting the target. Of but you, I mean, you can go out and buy an SMK PCP off the shelf and it will still put a 45 mil, 40 mil group yeah, in yeah. at 55 yards in the right That's conditions. It, exactly. The main thing is the scope. For the field target. Yeah. So buy your gun for a couple of hundred quid, so five hundred quid second hand. You, mm. You're doing really well. Uh, shove as much money as you can into the scope, okay. and that's where you that's where you you'll find your um, scores will improve. Well, yeah, I suppose it's, it's, it's the same. Let's say I'm going to take it back into a hunting hunting thing. I say that if you, anyone could buy a Seiko or a Blazer or any of that sort of stuff, as long as you put a scope on top, it's going to be representative of the quality of that rifle. I mean, otherwise, if, if you end up putting like a two, three hundred pound scope on there, you're not going to get as much out of the rifle as you possibly would. Which leads on to the final question, really. Um, if someone hasn't got the amount to spend on, say, a Delta Striker, say their budget's 500 quid, I mean, what sort of scopes are you going to 500 pound, uh, realistically, you can get a Falcon T50. As I said, you will quickly find the limits of them. Yeah. So what you want to do is find an old BSA, I have a BSA um, 1050 60. Mm-hmm. Uh, or the big Nico, which is the Nico Diamond, yes, they yeah. do a Mark One, Mark Two, and Mark Three. Yeah. All of which you should still be able to pick up for under five hundred pounds second yeah, yeah. hand. Um, I think I've, I've bought and sold a few of the BSAs and the Nicos um, back when I'd started and swapping to them from it. Yeah. And I was paying between three fifty, yeah. three fifty, four hundred pound. Yeah, some of them even as cheap. I've, I've found one with a crimp tube. Yeah. Crimped at the rear. Didn't make any difference at all hmm. to the performance of it. No. And I got that for two hundred quid. Yeah. And that's that's what you need. As long as you can test it and you find there's no performance issues yeah, yeah. with it, yeah. there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of damage to it. As long as it doesn't prefer, uh, take away from the yes. actual performance no. or usability. No, that's fair enough. Fair enough. Well, John, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you very much for uh, having me. Yeah, it's just uh, it's been interesting to listen about the world of FT. Um, as I say, obviously, you, uh, most of you guys know here that obviously I do a lot of hunting, so it's interesting to see uh, what happens when people actually take on the fascination of playing from a gun when they're 12 years old all the way through to an adult so it's uh, um, <laughs> um, so um, so yeah I hope you've enjoyed this guys I hope you've learned a bit from John I mean I know I certainly have today uh, and obviously any questions you've got at all 
feel free to email them in. Uh, we'll try and answer as best you can. Obviously, any FT directed ones will go to John. Um, and we can we can go from there. We'll answer them early next week. And uh, we'll see you guys then. Yeah, we we'll look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, John. No worries. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.